One of those boomers who elevated freak into a compliment and turned party into a verb. I was more worried about the mindless stunt he pulled in Norton's office because it meant Lenny's manic cycle could be kicking in. The one on mother's chest, noun, the taught me scar, raised striped where a breast had been. This picture was the strikeout king of the league. Uh, people weren't supposed to hit home runs off of him, let alone me. I was not necessarily a long ball hitter. My name is Kathleen West. I was born in Nebraska. I lived in Nebraska first on a farm three miles west of Genoa, Nebraska. Then I went to the University of Nebraska for my Bachelor of Arts. I taught two years secondary English in what is now Central High School. I believe it's located I'm not sure where it's located now, but it was the first year that Valparaiso and Ceresco and maybe some, and Raymond had come together. And then I moved away for a few years, came back in 1980 to do Poet in the Schools in Northeast Nebraska, working out of Wayne State College. And at that time, I I see thumbs up going up in the background when I, <laughs> when I say Wayne State College. And about that time, I decided that I was interested in a PhD and applied at the University of Nebraska and was accepted. And that led to me getting a job as professor uh, where I am now in New Mexico State University at Las Cruces, New Mexico but it's still there, not so blatantly, I don't think. Um, I don't have as, I don't write as many poems about my relatives anymore. I had a lot of stories to tell when I first started writing and growing up, well, Flannery O'Connor says, anyone who survived a childhood has enough material to la last for a lifetime. And since I grew up on a farm, I had a lot of material and I was also interested in presenting that life on the farm the way I felt it really was, which was not at all romantic. I mean, there were times that it was, of course, wonderful, but it was, it was hard work. And I wanted to present it the way it was. But Nebraska still figures. I mean, it's in, it's in my background when I'm writing, even, um, and I'll be reading tonight, I'm reading something about a passage when I was in Vietnam and then there's a reference to my father in the coffee shop talking to the farmers. So it's always in the back of, back of my mind. I was not encouraged to be a writer as a child. It was, mo it was important that I get an education so that I could support myself. I wrote as a child, as I think many do, little poems, little stories. It never occurred to me that, that someday I would be a writer, I would be a teacher, the way my mother was, the way my sisters were. Um, it was a friend who really helped me achieve the epiphany of realizing that this is what I wanted to do. But after that, uh, my mother was supportive once she figured out that I wasn't going to go to rack and ruin as a poet. And till this day, uh, my sister, Barbara Emig, has been a tremendous influence. Right now, she's my best editor. She can read something and just put her finger on the line and say, not that. As far as poets go, um, I was influenced, I think, like many young people, E. E. Cummings, Emily Dickinson, read Emily Dickinson in high school, and T. S. Eliot's *The Hollow Men*. Um, individual poems. When I went to the University of Nebraska, uh, I had a professor named Mordecai Marcus, who is apparently was and is a poet. I know he's a poet. I published him in my magazine, Puerto <laughs> del Sol. I was delighted to do that because he, in his literature class, uh, 
read the poems aloud to us, I was more touched by poets. And I remember, again, Emily Dickinson and E.E. E. But you know what? When I think about it, I, I also remember he read Yeats to us and other poets that at the time were, were beyond me. But they stuck with me. And later on, there were others. Carolyn Kaiser, Weldon Keyes, Tom McGrath, Marilyn Hacker, a long list, but that's just a few. When I first started writing poetry, I'm not counting the kitty stuff, um, I was, like many young people, I was miserable. And I wanted to write down my misery. And I felt that I could disguise, for some reason, well, yes, there was a reason. I needed to disguise this pouring out of my heart. So I figured the best way to do it would be to write it in po poetry form, figuring that anybody who stumbled across this journal, diary, notebook would not have any idea what I was talking about. Oh, misery still helps. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the great inspiration. Also, the absurdity of life. That's almost equal to misery right now, may, maybe even above it. Um, I will see things and hear things that I think make, that are just delightfully askew, off-center, and I will, in, maybe if I don't incorporate them, I, it will be a, taking off from. And in travels, of course, you run into absurd situations, and I delight in the absurd. I mean, you have to. My best way of writing poetry is when I'm not working for a living. So that would be during the summer. And I used to be a very early morning writer. But that has changed somewhat in the past five years. But it's, so it's a little bit more flexible now. I, in the summer, when I can live on my own time, it doesn't really matter. But probably morning is a better time. It would be foolish of me to say that I write only for myself. Uh, I do write to please myself. I hope that other people will want to read. I wish more people read my work. Uh, that, that, I don't mean to sound plaintive about that, but I think the work is, is accessible and a lot of it's pretty funny. And I think that people who think of poetry as being difficult would not feel that way with this work. I'm, I'm writing for whoever is willing to read it. Well, if they want to write, they'd better read. Uh, Pound says, read the classics, ancient and modern, read contemporary poets, want to write, don't think of getting published first. First hone your craft and then think about being published. After, I mean, there comes a time when there's no sense in just writing the poems and throwing them in a drawer. You, you have to go out into the world. but. There, there are a couple of answers to that. Um, you can start small, or you can aim for the big time. When I say big time, the slicks, the New Yorker. I've known people who have started and done well that way. Uh, most, like me, start with the regional magazines and then gradually grow into concentric circles. And also, if you're going to publish, you have to be very stubborn and willing to keep sending out poetry. Sylvia Plath sent her first manuscript out, I think, uh, 30 or 40 times before it got published. And that was in, what, late 50s, early 60s. And now there are hundreds, thousands more manuscripts going out. So. Buy a lot of stamps. I would like to publish my collected works. Um, the collected works which deal mainly with poems set or referring to Nebraska and the Plains. 
because I, th I think there's a, there would be a strong audience for that. I have, now that, that's publishing and not writing. I have an unpublished manuscript that I'm still tearing apart and putting back together. And I have lots of things floating around in the top of my head. I haven't written for a long time. I mean, it's been about a year. So I'm hoping this summer that some of these things that, that are floating will actually be able to come down onto the page. More, uh, more absurdist work, more work along the lines of the summer of the subcomandante, I think. I'm very fond of that, that form. Good evening. My name is Joanna Lloyd, and I am curator of the Heritage Room. Welcome to the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors and the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by or about Nebraska authors. Currently, we maintain a collection of over 12,000 volumes written by between three and 4,000 published authors from Nebraska. In one way of promoting these authors, the Heritage Room sponsors the John H. Ames Reading Series. This is our 149th Ames Reading. I would like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it is through an endowment established through their volunteer efforts that we are able to bring you programs like this. You should feel that you can come in to visit our collection during regular public service hours. Uh, I guess I could say now that we know we're going to be closed for renovation um, sometime in the near future. But after that's over or before it comes, you're welcome to come in and visit our collection and have a tour of the room and sit and read if you'd like to. Our reader tonight is Kathleen West. Born in Nebraska, she grew up on a farm outside Genoa. Her BA and PhD are from UNL, where she specialized in English and Icelandic studies. Her MA is from the University of Washington. She has traveled extensively in and has researched Cuba, Vietnam, Cambodia, Beijing, Mexico, Latin America, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Iceland, and the United Kingdom. She is a professor at the University of New Mexico at Las Cruces and is poetry editor, editor of Puerto del Sol. She is a poet and a writer of fiction. And tonight we will hear some passages from her novel, The Summer of the Subcommandante. There's a phrase I especially like, the main character, a woman, muses on the romance of her own revolutionary spirit, which is immediately followed by the word fizzles. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of adventurous, high romantic and respect rebellious spirit in this work, a work of poetic prose. Let us welcome Kathleen West, who, when spring break comes, comes back to Nebraska to read from her works. Welcome to the Heritage Room tonight. Thanks for coming out on tax night. I assume everybody in the audience has their taxes done. If not, bless your hearts for taking an hour <laughs> off. I'm going to begin from the, I'm going to read part of the prelude to the Summer of the Subcomandante, which is entitled Martin Luther's Children. She shivers her Sunday in the Augustana Lutheran Church basement. Where are the stories of Lutheran childhood? Of the child who twisted her Sunday school penny in a handkerchief and suffered the agony of knots during the disbelief of Jesus loves me. 
She drops the handkerchief into the wicker collection basket, afraid to ask for help, afraid to confess her inadequacy and tell mother, I lost it, I don't know how. She doesn't know her history, could not understand, even though she shares the torture of a priest who gave his name to the guilty religion of the plains. Let it begin with Martin Luther. Anna Anderson squirms on the organ seat to reach the pedals, and a flush creeps over her face, red as the hymnals. We sing, a mighty foredress is our God. <laughs> All is mystery. The grown-ups herd the nursery class into a quavering group before the congregation, and they repeat the Bible verse for the day. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Wait for Sundays. Watch for tornadoes, blizzards, and hail. Endure. Let it begin with a Nebraskan, child of the plains. She wrestles with brother on a black horse hide. Such a good workhorse, Sally was, and Dad felt so bad when she got old and blind and he had to shoot her. He spent $20 to have the hide blanketed on the yellow and green felt. This all happened before. Everyone remembers more. They remember Grandma and kerosene lamps and wishing for water by the windmill. They remember when Janie was born, 10 years after everyone else. Three days late for Christmas, tag along baby of the family. What can she remember? The last horse, Prince, they loaded into a truck and a man drove him away. Don't cry, it can't be helped. They didn't need him. Prince stood in the cow lot kicking furiously at the barn door and the man said he'd take him back east to pull a milk wagon. In country school, she squirted LePage's glue into brown circles on her desk and with her forefinger picked up each glob and licked it. <laughs> Don't you know what that's made of? Teacher asked. Prince is gone and it can't be helped. Don't cry whatever's destroyed. Weak-eyed kittens, crops, our dreams of growing up beautiful. Winter ruins everything, always winter. Snow and sleet and ice, those soft words, wrap her in a tight cocoon of winter, cancel the Christmas program, and if the ice doesn't weigh down the power lines, the telephone crackles, we can't make it for Christmas Eve. Or if the phone goes out early in the day, she stands on a chair, looking out the window above the kitchen sink, hoping for a headlight to flash on the hill until the electricity goes out, and there's nothing to do but go to bed and wait out the cold and dark. It can't be helped, but she cries under the weight of blankets topped by Sally's hide, heavy as the night. The early years are always winter, snowbound, housebound, in a frozen Whittier poem. In the center, she stands, a little onion, in layers of flannel and denim, a spongy brown snowsuit over all. She is a small brown circle on the snow, the dot to her father's exclamation, trailing him in the fox and goose path to the barn. Overshoes squeak on packed snow, oats rustle from bucket to feed box, and the cows munch, sigh, and shift their leg chains. Balanced on the tee of a milk stool, slab of wood nailed to a chunk of wood, she watches. Not that she's too little to milk, too slow. By the time Dad's finished with first cow, how'd you do, kid? She has but a thin white skim from Irene on the bottom of the pail. Her job is separator girl. Just before Dad strips the last drops from last cow, she runs past the calf pens to the separating room, plugs in the motor, and turns the crank. 
She wants it perfect. The separator just warmed up and ready to go when Dad lifts up the bucket of milk foaming like ivory snow. Seven days in a row she sat in a tub to make her skin white as snow. Snow skin, paper skin, ghost skin. Seven days of three-inch tepid water in the unheated bathroom and it didn't work. No go power from Cheerios. And even after building her body 12 ways with Wonder Bread, when brother picked her up to swing her like a monkey, she cried from the pain. Cream separates from the milk, yellow, thick, clotting the spout, and the milk, freed from its butter fat, rushes out in a translucent fall of bluish white. How's it work? The Omaha cousins asked. City kids. <laughs> Separators, corn pickers, and combines. It's magic, she said. <laughs> Everything divides. Wheat from straw, corn from cob, eggs to sell and eggs to eat. Feeder calves and cows, kids and grown-ups. Cows beller and the combine plugs up. Blue milk in the winter, green in the summer. Unless disguised by Rice Krispies and sugar, Janie hates farm milk, as she hates eggs, boiling meat, gravy, mushy applesauce and sauerkraut. She loves town food. <laughs> the milk bleached and clean and tall waxy cartons, cold meat pressed under cellophane with grand names like Thuringer, summer sausage, minced ham. Food with cartoon animals cavorting across the package like bunny bread and sugar crisp bear food, boxes of cereal with surprises inside. She refuses all chicken but the wishbone, eats her cherry pie backwards, crust to point, to wish on the last bite. She yanks up clover and splits the third leaf with her thumbnail, stands at the window each night and waits Star light, star bright, I wish I may, wish I might, and falls into horrifying contortions trying to kiss her elbow. <laughs> she learns to pray, bless and ask. Please God, bless me, bless mother, bless dad, bless brother, bless sisters. Please God, let me, please God, make me, Please, God, what are these wishes, these prayers? Born with a yearning for something other, something more, she spends her wishes as she can. They are her only currency, her medium of exchange. Let her begin with this wish, this prayer, that she will die not before she wakes. Keep her soul intact for the passing into the next season. I get to keep this. <laughs> Joanna mentioned that uh, one of my, some of my travels took me to Vietnam and this was, gosh, 10, 11 years ago. The United States had not normalized relationships with Vietnam, so it was theoretically illegal to go. There were tours, but they were hideously expensive, so I decided that I would go by myself. And when I came back, and even before, people were asking me, why do you want to go to Vietnam? And I found it very difficult to verbalize an answer. So when you can't verbalize something, you write it. So I have several answers to why I went to Vietnam, and this is one of them. So this is why I'm in Vietnam, answer three, apocalypse now, bar. <laughs> That's true. Um, 
you probably know this, I, I mentioned the Aozai, that's the traditional dress of the Vietnamese women, the, the pants and the, the long tunic that's, that slid up the side, um, really elegant and lovely. Um, most people just wear them for dress or for tourists now, but um, in the city in the middle of Vietnam, Hue, people still wore them. I don't know why I'm going on about fashion, but fashion is important to me when I travel. Okay. When the Australian vet says to me, we were here 25 years ago, I suppose you were in school protesting the war then. I wish I could just say yes and let it go. I think of all the people who ask me, supplying their own reasons, the travel agent who wonders if anyone close had been killed over there, the friend sighing over my penchant for tragic countries, my father who says to the other retired farmers in the coffee shop that I'm just like Jane Fonda. <laughs> He means the one before Ted Turner, <laughs> the one before the exercise videos, 25 years ago in Hanoi, perched atop an anti-aircraft gun, forever smiling. I'll send him the photo of me crawling out of the M48 on the tourist trail at Koo Chi with that big grin I keep pasted on my face while I'm here, and let him hold us both in his irrefutable memory of the past. Smiling, smiling. I make a date to go to the Apocalypse Now bar with the Australian vet that night. It seems like something I can tell people when they ask me how Vietnam was. The shots of Russian vodka and Mekong whiskey backed by lukewarm 333 beer. European disco music from the late 70s blurring the scraps of conversation. 20 miles north, right on top the VC tunnels. First time in Saigon. Back then, it was only for the Yanks and killed 50 water buffalo. I'll continue with dinner at Maxime's, where the waiters are Parisian elegant and just as snotty, but everyone says the food is worth it. I'll end in the hotel room, stood up eating bananas, pomelos, and scraping the jelly out of a young coconut. It's a good time to practice description. Note the mixture of past elegance and American salvage, the textured wallpaper and teak beams framing the old airline seats for chairs, and an orange bedspread with yellow bambies frolicking on it. Three floors down, the hotel lobby sparkles with light, and the beautiful woman in the white outside behind the desk. Outside, people keep watch as you cross the lobby. At night, they spot you when you're still coming down the stairs. They're ready with postcards, cigarettes, t-shirts, and other more mysterious goods. But you won't stop to look closely You've learned how to move down streets, halls, across small parking lots, fast, in a straight line, as if you know exactly where and why you're going. I'm not going to do a travelogue, but this one was written after the first time I went to Cuba where I've been going since the late 80s. Um, there are some Spanish words in here, some of which will be familiar to you, perhaps in different contexts. At the, at the revolution of um, 1959 in Cuba, I believe it was then that the mixed drink, rum and coke with ice, rum and coke with lime, See, it's been so long, <laughs> was named Cuba Libre, which means free Cuba. Well, also at the time of the Russian, Russian the Cuban Revolution, I have not been to the Russian Revolution, <laughs> <laughs> although I did tell my students the other day in class, I am 76, <laughs> and some of them believe me, I am not. <laughs> Uh, 
also at the time of the, the Cuban Revolution, a number of people fled Cuba and settled in Miami. And those people drank the same mixed drink, rum and coke with lime, except they called it Cuba mentira, which means Cuba lies. <laughs> In the early 60s, the CIA backed an invasion of Cuba, which United States Indians refer to as the Bay of Pigs. In Cuba, that's called the victory of Playa Giron, the victory of Giron Beach. This is called Post-Revolutionary, Post-Modern, Post-Revisionist Protocol. I walk into a party the way first-time offenders walk into a prison, promising good behavior, hoping to get out fast and not get hurt. This time it's a fancy house in a development so committed to preserving the natural southwest environment there aren't any street lights. I park my truck where I see a line of cars on the side of the road and night blind my way on a curving sidewalk, staying on the cement, not daring to beeline over the black lawn rocks toward the wavering light marking the entrance. The party's post-feminist, post-chauvinist, with at least two separated couples each with his or her new friend, lover, business associate, their expressions ranging from stubborn glee to decided misery. The party's child-centered, with a couple of under tens banging out childhood chords on the piano, a couple of under fives clinging to various adult legs, and a few wise over twelves heaping their plates at the table and vanishing. The party's bilateral, with one group in the kitchen and another hunkered down by the comfortless May fireplace. I choose the kitchen and the freestanding counter. No matter where I position myself, I can spot a way out. The hostess is blonde, ethereal in 100% wrinkle-free white cotton from Desert Bloom Boutique. She wants to know just how Cuba was, and I've barely brought wonderful out of my mouth when a man starts asking questions. He's less interested than determined. Where did you go? Why was it wonderful? What did you think? The more unsatisfied my bubbly answers make him, the more I borrow from the paragraphs of the history books. In fact, I am doing a pretty good imitation of John Foster Dulles when he looks down with a soft, secret smile to say, oh, the horrible things I could tell you. I believe you, I say, but you should have told me you were Cuban. A combination of embarrassment and betrayal infiltrates our minds like a brainstormed idea for a new cocktail. I say Cuba Libre, you say Cuba Mentira. I say Playa Giron, you say Bay of Pigs. I say Fidel, you say Castro. Oh, baby, let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> Somebody pulls my arm. I must meet a young woman with a tattoo on her throat who's been in town six months and is, and is finding it hard to meet people. Keep it that way, I think. <laughs> but what I say is, these things take time and start the touching of the shoulders, elbows, and wrists of the people between me and the door. Good night, my neighbors. Good night, my fellow exiles. Good night, hostiles and friendlies. Good night. Okay, let's have a little change of pace now. This is from a section entitled Before Family Values.
and it's called How Grown-Ups Are Right. When she swallowed her gum, the grown-ups said, don't do that, it'll stick in your stomach. Their shrill voices interfered with the pleasures of gum swallowing, so she burrowed into a Chesterfield chair, face first, whenever she wanted to swallow her gum. The pleasure was worth the risk, as her big sister said before she went away for a couple of months. And there might not be any <laughs> risk at all. Grown-ups were always saying, you'll put your eye out, or you'll get horns on your head if you frown like that. She'd grown no horns, and her eyes still gleamed intact. Grown-ups have never been right about anything except in an isolated case in Delaware, and that was probably just luck. <laughs> the grown-ups watched. They planned on making an example out of her. The next time a kid wanted to swallow gum, they'd be ready. They'd say, don't swallow your gum. It'll stick in your stomach, just like that little girl, and you know what happened to her. Even with their poor record, even though they didn't know what would happen, they waited for something terrible to afflict the little girl. As it turned out, the grown-ups were right. Every day the little girl swallowed a wad of gum, and every day the gum stuck to her stomach. In fact, her stomach was soon lined with gum. Gum stuck to her pancreas, her liver, her lungs. But nothing terrible happened. The little girl liked it when the gum stuck to her lungs because each breath was like sniffing an unwrapped stick of juicy fruit. <laughs> About the time the little girl switched to double mint, the grown-ups stopped watching. They figured they were wrong again, but they were still saying to kids, don't swallow your gum and don't do that, you'll hurt yourself. Being wrong doesn't necessarily stop a grown-up. When the gum stuck to the soles of her feet on the inside, the little girl began to bounce as she walked. Her steps were long and high in the air. She began leaping over obstacles instead of going around just for fun. She could run all the way down to the store and back without getting tired. And she didn't often use the ladder to get into her bunk bed. Eventually, she became the first person to win Olympic gold medals in track and gymnastics. She won so many medals that when the photographer told her to hang them around her neck for the picture, they made a complete circle of gold around her body. Her name was a worldwide household word. Kids and parents alike wrote her name at the top of their most admired list. No one had ever seen a person so physically talented, so strong and supple. Walter Cronkite arranged an exclusive interview with her and, of course, asked to what she attributed her fantastic success. She smiled, her beautiful, slow smile that never showed any teeth and gestured gracefully. The motion picture industry thought it was too bad about her voice. It was barely above a whisper. Breakfast cereal companies worked round the clock to figure out a way to use her in television, even though her agent said she wasn't interested. She just signed with the American Ballet Theater. One of the CBS technicians had to turn up her microphone so everyone could catch what she said. Well, Mr. Cronkite, she murmured, as a child, I was around grown-ups who knew what was best for me. When the grown-ups heard this, they were relieved. She hadn't given them away. You see, the little girl wasn't little anymore. She was a grown-up.
and there's always one thing you can say about grown-ups. They stick together. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The next one is from the section in the book entitled, Richard Nixon Made Me Do It. I realized that Richard Nixon's career followed my life for a long time. Um, I think he was a senator in, oh, I've, oh that's all right, you can always make up, mix up the facts. Um, Never let the facts get in the way of the truth. I think when I was, I was born, he was a representative in the California uh, uh, state legislature. But at any rate, our careers, our, my life and his career went together. So this is May 10th, 1994. It has, that's 18 days after Richard Nixon's death. And it has an epigraph from Flaubert. Happiness is a red cloak with a tattered lining. When you try to cover yourself with it, the wind blows it to pieces, and you find yourself floundering in the chilly rags of something you had thought would bring you warmth. The eclipse is annular, 18 days after Richard Nixon's death, 12 days after the death of a woman a thousand miles from Richard Nixon, a thousand light years from my heart. There are people I confess this to. I looked at the sun, looked to see the moon edging across, a circle of silver creeping its way over the sun. It was not enough to sense the light alter around me, not enough to shrink down, pressed by an inexplicable combination of melancholy and peace. I was six the first time I looked at the sun, tempted by the lore of afternoon recess. If you look at the sun, you'll sneeze. With six sneezes, you can make a wish. I wished and wished, but no one told me the formula to make the wish come true. I passed on the pony, the amazing pre-Barbie doll in the Sears catalog with flexible limbs and gorgeous clothes. Let me be happy, I wished. The pastel stories in my school reader, the nightly tale of the little blue country car, my sister's excellent rendition of the wolf and the seven kids told me nothing. Instead of the 23rd Psalm on the living room wall, I needed Flaubert and his definition. I would wear red. I would be happy. When Richard Nixon was president, I sewed a red cloak for my happiness and wore it but once. It was the cliché in, in the second line of the poem, obvious to everyone but me. They quoted Grimm. They sang Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. Perhaps some of the men pinched my cheek. In 1974, I believed I had suffered too much to be that young. And I dreamed that Henry Kissinger hand delivers a note from me to Richard Nixon. I have an appointment at one o'clock to discuss women's rights with him, but my ex-husband and the man I left him for distract me. They have organized a party in our hotel room, and there are so many people, so many couples to meet, all the engagement rings to admire. Yes, I say, diamonds are forever, but I must leave, I must leave. A few days later, Richard Nixon resigns in a whirl of helicopter blades, victory signs, and tears. Say, I left too. After 20 years, it's easy to blend the facts, easy to say Nixon quit and so did I, just as the eclipse, his death, and the loss of a woman I feared will blend into my own private kenning that I will repeat someday if I live long enough to remember. Okay. 
when I was in Southeast Asia, um, I also went to Cambodia because I figured it couldn't be any worse or more terrifying than Vietnam. So I wanted to see the ruins at Angkor Wat. And this, I'm, I'm very glad I went because people weren't going then because <laughs> it was dangerous. And I was essentially the only one at the ruins and it was, it was, it was delightful. There's, I won't go into why certain ruins are named different things, but there, there's one particular one that's called the Terrace of the Leper King, which makes a good title. And this is dealing with the discomfort that I feel in my own country and how sometimes the discomfort I feel in a foreign country is maybe easier. I don't know. We used to speculate why Grandpa, the one who described us as hailing from preachers and horse thieves, really left the country. The accepted explanation of the sailing on a one-way passage to collect money owed to his father's fishing business the disappearance of the debtor, our grandfather stranded, pioneer alone and penniless, holds as little water as the dry Nebraska plains where he stopped, if not settled. My mother supposes some faint scandal. My brother figures he snuck out to avoid the Swedish army. The men of the family, all secure with their service records, chuckle a little about Grandpa and his draft dodging. I say fear, and we all stop talking. I talk little here. I have a few polite phrases of the language, enough to make the women in the market grin at each other, sometimes at me. At the ruins, children emerge to guide me up the crumbling steps to the shrines. In a mixture of French, English, and Khmer, they tell me the, the names of ancient kings and which Buddhas have lost their heads to the Khmer Rouge. When we hear gunshots in the jungle, they say, army, but they don't or won't understand my questions about who or what's being shot. They want to know how old I am and teach me the numbers laughing when I indicate with my fingers the necessity for one more decade. One shakes her head. Very old, she says. <laughs> my guidebook shows a transliteration of phrases like, I didn't do it. Contact next of kin. As well as, I'm interested in those earrings. <laughs> At night when the electricity goes out, I speak the words into the darkness of the guest house. I won't use any of them, but I practice anyway, wanting the security of sentences that release me from guilt, assure me of a life beyond these borders, and provide the perilous pleasure of ma material possession. I imagine my grandfather, alone and bewildered at Ellis Island, not a word of English to his name, but striding out, carrying reasons and fortune in his head, glad to be away from everyone asking in his own language why, why he was going to America. Now he could believe that by moving in this enforced muteness, he would listen not to the language within his heart, but to the clatter of the sound around him, that with stubborn determination and the strength of fate, he would transform into a kind of music, untranscribable, a dissident melody he could hum only to himself. And I'm going to close with another Southeast Asia. Um, First of all, I need to make sure you know what a sarong is. If you've, uh, 
they are not, uh, it's okay if I step aside, isn't it, to demonstrate this? <laughs> okay. If you've seen anything like the Hope, uh, Hope Crosby Lamore road pictures, you know that Dorothy Lamore was always uh, dashing about in a, a, a glamorous something tied above her ample bosom. That's not a sarong. A sarong is tied around your waist and it is worn now with a t-shirt and it's really very comfortable and practical attire and when I was in Cambodia both men and women wore them so of course I wanted a sarong. Now I'm moving back. Um, so I went to the market to buy one and I discovered you can't buy sarongs <laughs> ready-made. Uh, well, I didn't know. Uh, so they sold me this big piece of cloth. And so I thought, well, I, all right, that's a sarong. And if you just wrap it appropriately, it will stay on. And after about an hour of trying to wrap it, I finally went down and showed it to my landlady. And she laughed at me, but nicely, <laughs> and said that you, know, you run it up on the sewing machine. So what it is is a circle of cloth, and you stand inside. and then you do this elaborate tucking and folding, and then it stays on if you're Cambodian. <laughs> okay. All right, that's the fashion part. The other part is when I was traveling through Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, um, I was asked the question that I often am asked: Why I tra Why are you traveling? Why as a woman are you traveling alone? And then the follow-up questions, do you have a husband? Why is it your husband with you, et cetera, et cetera. And usually I try to be uh, honest and feminist about it. Uh, no, I'm not married. I don't need a husband. I travel, you know. But in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, I got, the questions just kept coming so often that I gave up. <laughs> I said, I have a husband. <laughs> and with, I found that with every place I visited, he developed a little bit. <laughs> so there was more and more information about him until I had this entire family that I'd invented. Okay. Then uh, it is probably useful to know um, this is the geography part. Mandalay is in Burma, and it used to be known as the Golden City, which it is no longer. I think very little in Burma is golden today. But I always wanted to go to Mandalay, so this is entitled The Road to Mandalay. <clears throat> I'm ready. I have my sarong bargained for and bought at the Siem Reap market for $2 American. Good deal for me, good deal for the vendor. But after too much imagination, frustration, and twisting in front of the generator-powered fan of the Aspera guest house, trying to keep the sarong around my waist, I asked my landlady. With a swoop of her hand, she demonstrated she was standing in a circle of cloth unexotic, a tube of material run up on the sewing machine. Madam soon misinterpreted the disappointment flicking in my face and said she would sew it for me and show me how to wrap it. Later, when I folded it about myself and I still couldn't get it to stay tucked, the difficulty brought back the appropriate authenticity. This has nothing to do with fashion. It's adventure. I have my sarong. I'm ready to hit the road to Mandalay. No matter that I've confused a Hope Crosby Lamour road picture with Kipling's poem, Hope and Crosby never went to Mandalay, and Kipling dressed his sweet maiden in a yellow petticoat. But my sarong is for Mandalay, where morning mist curves around corners. The only startling sound is a temple bell, and every intrigue leads straight to romance. I miss romance. I've given up explaining why a woman like me travels alone. Yes, I have a husband. He is in the hotel room because he is tired. 
or in Bangkok, where I will meet him after his important conference. Sometimes he is at work in America, business work, his company unable to spare him so many weeks. The questions accumulate until my husband develops, a stubborn character in a contemporary American novel who frustrates even the novelist. On a bus out of Saigon, he acquires his steady, rather boring job. On the Neutron Beach, he exhibits his laziness. In Hue, I discover his name is Donald. He is 10 years younger than I in Hanoi and smokes too much. On the flight to Phnom Penh, we have no children, but his mother lives with us. I think she would not approve of my sarong, would ask if the Cambodian market sold underskirts. And if I were foolish enough to tell her of the time Lon Nall declared the sarong illegal, outlawed it as decadent apparel, she would nod and say, there's something to be said for the far right. <laughs> I will not tell her that tomorrow I am cadging a ride to the border with some UN troops, a crossing officially off limits, but open to me, as is the road to Mandalay, the road taken, not taken where no one asks about a husband and no sarong ever needs a safety pin. Thank you very much.